guys out now? The guy who they want to throw the gutter? I don't know. Turn it up for a run. Turn it up for a run. Yeah. 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 Pretty sure that's dude got shot. That's see you hear that? You hear that? What? You just kicked the shot. So you didn't hear it? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. like a little I think he actually got shot. It's in the street. You see him? They're pumping his chest. They're pumping his chest, dog. Yeah, they're pumping his chest. That means they clipped him. Yeah, there's a shell right there. I got it on the floor. There's a shell right here. The shell right there, yeah, there's shells everywhere. Look at all these shells in the floor. That's what I said, man. They're trying to resuscitate them. I would have gone back. That dream was over, the voice says. Full of shells, gravel, liquid washing stones. Back, meaning lost island or calendar. Back, which is a thing rigged with bones, unbending, unfolding past the hard symmetry of clocks. To make of my spine a chapel how the form of me can't get any closer to itself. Sankofa sorrow, unkissable elbow, vertebrae propped against the vertigo of all our good myths. There is here, is there. Home, a word hollow as the bone of birds. Flying has its uses. Or if these shapes are how it began for Suda Sandu, who the overseers barred from praying on land. So he built the temple in the sea, such oneric geometry, carcass of a marlin, carcass of a dream. So what? Even a thing undone is a thing becoming. So much is asked of us to be prism, to be fagwa, to be all colors always. On certain days, I wish for bare life, to be bare and elusive, or at least to be enough. Perhaps a terzarima of wood, doorway in the ground, but then again, every skeleton is a sculpture. All my lovely bones unscattered to stand in the wreck of itself.
the North Alberta family of a woman who recently graduated from college are seeking help from the public as police try to determine how she fell to her death from 31 stories of a downtown Toronto high-rise. Bella Lubbockin McLean, 25, was found on the ground outside a condominium in the Queen's Key area early on July 20th. On September 8th, 1985, artist Anna Mendieta fell 34 floors to her death from the window of her Greenwich Village apartment. A recording of Carl Andre's 911 call showed him saying that during a quarrel she somehow went out the window. When I first landed in this cold place, for one is always meant to land here, I lived on the third floor of a high-rise downtown, a place called City Place, all silver and gray and stacked with lonely glass, City Place common nouns for a utopia, no place, the grays of an anywhere, nowhere, a place I may have passed, someone like Bella, but not known, since we are meant to pass, not to know. From a certain distance, the buildings could look like shelves, all together a library arranged Dewey Decimal style, each balcony the same gray book. Perhaps it began in a small industrial city in southern Ontario. In the days when I was small, playing, hiding, imagining in the half-built houses of the expanding suburbs, the plain white walls of our newly built home in our town named after an Aboriginal chief, where the only other black child I knew was my brother, three years my senior. And then my training in design, the ethic of form that follows function, of products that perform in a tangible world, things that fill our needs. From wherever it comes, as it happens, I am never so moved as by the simplicity of the minimalist form. She, a Cree woman, it must be said, found on the ground of a condo, condominium, a word made of glass, from the Latin con, together with, and dominium, right of ownership. Give me a dictionary for death. Earlier that year, Andre wrote to his new bride, Darling Anna, your theme is the pregnant earth. My theme is the universe before the earth and after. Yours is the jewel, mine is the setting. I think about the two of them there in that room, his moment having come and gone, hers rapidly approaching, before the earth and after, an incantation, that he might be so expansive that the earth itself might come and go and leave him standing, that she might take up only the smallest of moments, might simply fade away. I have long since left the condo to live with Kay, we were married the day before Bella was gone, near Lake Ontario, who saw all of us. The reports say that no one can say, no one saw anything, no one knows why, but the water is a witness. In so many ways, it feels like a betrayal that I'm compelled by these materials and processes, that this would be the tongue in my mouth, the language that I speak. She, a one with a name, on a list of names, dread ledger of the missing and murdered, name writ in water and carried back to Peace River. Her name was Bella Lubbockin McLean. Her name was Anna Mandietta. I think often about what it meant for him to want to make her disappear, what it means that he wouldn't allow her to exist, that his smallness required so much space that she couldn't so much as draw breath in the world alongside him. Bella, whose face was beauty. Bella, from the Latin bellus, for beauty. And there is also Bella from bellum, which means wars. What does it take to wage war for beauty, or to make beauty despite and against and out of war? She, a Cuban woman, it must be said, 
But who am I to say, to say the name Bella? I who never knew the rights to return a spirit to the land. I who never knew the rights of my own Kalanago people, the rights to read the leaves. We need rights for the dead. The dead have rights. What is a Cree word for gone? What is the Spanish word for gone? No grammar for how she left us. Fall, is that the word? Did she fall? Who does it hurt to say fall? She, a Cree woman. She, an I, a she. This we must remember. Who is Bella in the small sentence? She, a Cuban woman. She, an I, a she. This we must remember. Who is Anna in the small sentence? Who am I to say the name, to exhibit the broken body? She, a one with a name on a list of names, dread ledger of the missing and murder. She, a one with a name on a list of names, dread ledger of the missing and murdered. She, she a, one a one with, with a name, name on a, on a list, list of names, names dread, dread ledger, ledger of, of the, the missing, missing and, and murdered. murdered. Impossible arabesque, Arabian horse. I know Jean-Paul Goud wants me to see all animal, lucency, oil. But who is grace and what is beauty? Beauty is brute, brute beauty. Beauty is all that. The limbs cut and paste to do what no body can do, a built, body is that beauty i do not trust i do not trust the eye only maybe the mandarin fish who can see it all in one eye the pupil fluttering the cornea grape globe bulbous swerving larger than ours the better to see beneath looking thing on the surface of which is a city of nerves bodied unbodied, bound, or the frog. The frog can see through it. We need frog eyes for this history. But a woman with a mic is grace, not history. Grace is singing, her voice, hers. And who is grace? And what is beauty? The eye is monstrous, and here, the gods are snapping, splaying their hands, be monstrous in the shifting light. My quest has been to find a way to make music as physical as sculpture might be, and sculpture as ethereal as music is. The flash, the pulse, the bomb, the gunshot, the rupture, the skipped record, his voice and his legendary generosity. And here we see his generosity manifested as soulful interdisciplinarity and through King and Jimmy as genius sonority. Rivering, I've known rivers. Oh, my friends, if there is any one thing that we must see today is that these are revolutionary times. King's vibrato, rivering beyond speech, stretching the line past the grave to shimmering song, shaking sound to shake off the line of time. Machine gun tearing my body all apart. Evil man make me kill you. Evil man make you kill me. 
Ghost in the hive, arc of time, terrible time, bodies skinned and flagged. Jimmy's guitar quarreling with skinning and flagging, refusing the assigned slots of big H history. Evil man make me kill you, even though we're only families apart. Well, I pick up my ax and fight like a farmer, but your bullets still knock me down to the ground. Jimmy and King shoot the still, still and not still, no stillness in the archive, but here it is still, still the bomb. Who say the archive is still? The archive is alive. Your work speaks to me in many voices. Spiritual collaboration, I call it, for the inner life of light. Dada is disruption, diaspora is disruption, terror and pleasure are lovers forever. And I don't know about you, I ain't gonna study war no more. The voice speaking, then marooning into music, the guitar groaning and languaging bright disasters. How does a sound fight the wars? How does a sound unfight the wars? A beautiful symphony of brotherhood. King, Jimmy, and Terry's company to each other, way of being together, of not living and dying alone. Relation and simultaneity when all times touch how do we think diasporically? How do we visualize the multiplicity of the mind? This is poesis, their remaking that transforms global violence into aesthetic possibility. Get those poems rolling in the meantime. Well then, Terry, we tear our hair from the beauty. We yearn to hear with our eyes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and thanks so much for being here with us. We were just going to shift now into a conversation and to talk about um, some of how we've come to this work. Um, it was really wonderful to be invited to speak and create something in response to the exhibit that's on right now in the power plant. And both of us felt all of these points of connection um, in a lot of ways. And so we'll talk a bit about that, um, and then we're going to open up to questions and to having a conversation with you guys. Uh, we're just going to start, I'm going to share a bit of my current work. And for me, I'll say the connection that I feel to the work in the exhibit right now um, is really like thinking about this work of Stuart Hall's, this idea of encoding and decoding. and what he talked about in terms of the ways in which power is encoded in the everyday language that we use, such that it becomes so neutral that we don't even understand it anymore and we take it for granted. Um, and so this for me is really connected to what I've been exploring in terms of my sculptural work. Um, a lot of what I've been engaging with is this idea of my relationship to minimalism as an aesthetic as well as the movement of minimalism. And minimalism is this movement that holds this idea that it's possible to create work that is so formal and so basic and neutral that it exists without relationship to the cultural and social and political world around it. Mm. And this work mainly, this movement, it was mainly these white men of a certain moment. And I think that, and for me it was kind of interesting coming to this aesthetic that really resonates for me as somebody who is not male and not white. Um, and thinking about the fact that it's impossible for somebody like me to make work that doesn't exist with reference to a social, cultural, political context. Um, so this work that I've been exploring is really that, exploring my relationship to it. And so what I've been looking at is 
creating these site-specific installations that are really about recontextualizing these minimalist forms, so placing them out into the natural world. A lot of what was carried in this idea of the forms created within the minimalist movement was that they had this kind of singularity and something very absolute about their relationship to the world. And I thought it was interesting to look at what it means to place them in this real world, other world context. Um, and you can go to the next slide here. And so it was interesting, this, um, these pieces took place in Barbados, and it was interesting to place this work into the natural world and to see how it played out. And there was this element of destruction that came into play. The fact that, you know, even though these were fairly structurally sound when they came up against the natural elements, they were really taken down in all of these very violent ways. Um, and you can go to the next one here. And so this piece uh, took place in NASA, actually across the street from Christian's childhood home. And if you're familiar with the work of Carl Andre and Anna Mendieta, so Carl Andre was one of the big figures within the minimalist movement. Um, and he created these very simple minimalist forms. Uh, he married Anna Mendieta in 1985. Her work, on the other hand, was very much in relationship to the natural world, mm -hmm. very impermanent, using her body. Um, and he threw her out of a window not long after they were married. And for me, there was something really interesting. I think that their relationship embodies, in many ways, this tension that I feel towards minimalism. And as it happened in this piece, I didn't do it intentionally, but I created these forms that are very much in relationship to the work of Carl Andre and placed them out in the natural world. And it was interesting because in placing them there, they were so completely overwhelmed by the world around them. They became very, very small. And um, you can go to the next one here. Um, actually, we can keep going. So I'm just going to kind of skip through this. We can go, yeah, a few more. So really, again, looking at what it means to recontextualize these objects. Um, you can keep going. The next one. And the next. I think we're going to go about three, two more. OK. And then one more. Awesome. Right. Uh, <laughs> so this was one that we, we used uh, where Christian wrote a piece in response to it. Um, and I'll just say really quickly that this form was originally developed um, in response to thinking about Caribbean roti huts. Uh, and I looked, I was thinking about what it means to exist in the world as an immigrant, as part of the diaspora. Um, and there's this way in which I think you always live in different places and different times at the, at the same time. Um, there's always this part of you that lives with what your life would have been had you never left the place that you came from, as well as this idea of like maybe one day going home. Hmm. And that's what I was thinking about in terms of these three planes in this like harsh relationship to each other. Um, and we can skip right through. And maybe, do you want Well, to yeah, I was gonna jump in since that's the piece that I responded to. Um, and one of the things that I, I was um, thinking about and we were thinking about is, um, in the kind of elegiac tone of the piece, we didn't do that intentionally, but you know the work is is really you know as most of you know a kind of tribute to Terry Adkins, who I'll talk about in a second, but it's also a tribute to Stuart Hall, and we we lost both of them last year, huge huge losses, and and for me um, this piece, the piece that I responded to. Um, is really kind of a monument to Stuart Hall. Um, so Stuart Hall was a pioneering Jamaican-British intellectual who, um, who was really important to our thinking about cultural studies, but our, but our, our sort of thinking about diaspora. I mean, many of us are from migrant backgrounds or immigrants ourselves, that he was really at the forefront of trying to think through 
um, how do we sort of work through these unstable identities and how do we work through um, for me, some of the pain, <clears throat> the pain of the liminal spaces we occupy, right, of this thing of being here and there at the same time or in many places at once, as Kara talked about. And so I was thinking about that. I used some of Stuart Hall's language in, in the poem itself. Um, but I was also thinking about how we don't talk enough about um, how Stuart Hall's work comes out of his own personal pain, right? Coming out of Jamaica and how deeply classist um, a society it is and how deeply um, colorist it is and how he needed to escape that society. And I think we often think about diaspora as this kind of you know, exciting thing of being transnational and having hybrid identities. But there's also a real pain, right, and a real sense of loss in, I mean, I know for me and many of us in being here or being away, existing away. And I think for Stuart Hall as well, even though it didn't come out directly until later in his work. So I was thinking about that as well as the work that organizes this exhibit, the exhibit on the unfinished conversation, which is the encoding and decoding essay, which for me and, and for us is, is really about the meaning of marginalization. Um, as Kara said, that you know, it's really brilliant and important for us to think about the ways in which we don't even see how the everyday encodes these sort of um, acts or, or these power relations, right? Um, and so it's interesting to connect or make the connections, even though they seem disparate, to what seems to be explicit violence, the spectacular violence of Sami Yatim being killed, right? How do we re relate that to the everydayness of the lake shore? Um, so we're trying to make a couple different kinds of connections. Yeah, and I'll say there, um, you know, it's interesting. For me, I thought a lot about the way, I think we live in this moment where there's this idea when we talk about racism, when we talk about sexism, there's this idea that it's about language, it's about political correctness, and it's as small as that. Um, and what we were thinking about a lot, what we kept coming back to, was the real violence and the real danger of existing in these marginal spaces. What it means when your life and the loss of your life doesn't matter quite as much. Yeah. Um, so that's you know us thinking about police violence, thinking about missing and murdered Aboriginal women. What does it mean when? And it's interesting. I I had a conversation with a friend the other day about. Um, the way in which predators have this innate understanding of the vulnerability of their victims, of their prey. Um, this is kind of a tangent, but um, men who abuse their wives, it of often the first time that it happens is when their wives are pregnant. And I think there's kind of a preternatural knowledge there that that's the moment at which a woman is probably not going to leave because of her vulnerability. And, and thinking about the way that we have an innate knowledge of, or the way that predators have an innate knowledge of vulnerability in certain moments, I think about what it means for a police officer to choose to pull a trigger at a certain time, right? Yeah. Like, what will the consequences be? And if there's a certain person standing in front of them, the consequences may not be very great, right? A man who comes across, you know, a particular woman, a woman of color, an Aboriginal woman in this country is less likely to be caught and convicted, right? And so there's this knowledge and the and it plays out in this real in these real world consequences for certain people. Yeah. 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 I was thinking um and we were talking endlessly and trying to figure out what are we, you know, trying to do in this piece that we put, put together. And I think um, it is really about what's the relationship between the spectacular and the everyday. And I think the exhibit is doing that. And I, you know, we're really, if you haven't seen it, you have to see the exhibit. No question about it. But again, I mean, I sort of go back to what is this, what is the relationship between um, 
the African American man who was just murdered yesterday by a police officer, um, and that kind of spectacular violence, and and the everyday, and how the everyday is organized, um, and and trying to think about, you know, why. Bella Lubbockin McLean is forgotten, or why did Carl Andre not get convicted for pushing Anna Mendieta out the window? Um, you know, we need to ask these questions. Why is a prime minister of this country does not think that it's sort of worth, you know, paying attention institutionally and systematically to Missing, missing and murdered Aboriginal women. You know, how, sort of how do we ask these questions? And what was also inspiring, especially thinking about the exhibition and how it's interested in archives and memory, um, and John Acomfer talked about marginalized people not having archives, is the way in which um, the movement, this sort of amazing movement of um, indigenous women setting up this database themselves called Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women um, be in response to um, Harper not paying any attention to cases like Bella Lubbock and McLean, right? Um, so we sort of wanted to think about all that and also think about, um, in, in my poetry, I kept on sort of coming back to this idea of beauty and art making, but also in, in terms of how we see humans um, and I'm pulling back now because I need to tell the Terry story and I forgot that. Um, but I want to tell that quickly and then I think we'd love to hear questions from everyone to have a conversation. But just quickly, um, for it is a reason that we're even here, is that Terry Adkins, who also passed away last year, is a brilliant, um, was a brilliant African-American conceptual artist who I met in 2012 at the University of Pennsylvania where he's a professor. I was doing a poetry reading and he attended the reading. Embarrassingly, I didn't know who he was. A friend of mine said that he knew how good he was even though he didn't get as much credit as, as he deserved. I didn't know he, who he was then. But he, he came to my reading, you know, this established, generous, brilliant artist, and he bought four books. Like, who does that, right? Four of my books, right? I didn't, my mother didn't buy four of my books. <laughs> and so he bought one for himself, one for his wife, one for his son, and one for his daughter. And then he offered to collaborate. Um, and so we were meant to collaborate here at the power plant with his band called the Lone Wolf Corps, and, and he passed away, sadly. Um, so, you know, talking to Gitan, who so generously um, allowed us to sort of do something in his honor and in response to the exhibit, I mean, that's really how in, in some ways, by accident, we're here, and we sort of have this platform to share with you. So, so it's really all in honor of Terry Atkins. And I really encourage all of you, he's less known than Stuart Hall, but I encourage all of you to find his work. Um, is there anything else you want to add? No. We can open it up, if anybody has any questions. Okay, well, I didn't know there was a microphone. Is this on? Um, the, the piece with the, the cubes, um, yeah. the cubes on the shore, um, that was such an incredibly violent piece for me. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering what you were thinking about as you were making that, because it, it was almost like the negative space mm. held. It was like a container, and, and I was like, there should be hammocks in there, huh. you know? Okay. So um, 
yeah, I was, I was just wondering what you were thinking about as you were, as you were putting that together. Hmm, that's a great question. I'm kind of curious to ask you about what about it felt violent. Yeah. Um, I will answer first. Maybe you can answer. But um, no, I mean, for me, in many ways, these were forms that I kind of had in my head, and I was curious to see what it would look like to place them here. Um, it was interesting, like, it was very violent in all of these ways, like the environment itself, what it meant to like, these were like pretty big structures and Christian was helping me, and what it meant to build them, and it was quite an isolated area to carry them like a half mile down the beach each way um, in the like burning hot sun, and ultimately they ended up being destroyed in all of these ways. There was, there were a couple that were placed into the ocean and just like completely taken down and there was this moment and for me it was really important that this work is impermanent that it didn't scar the landscape and so I needed to go out and actually retrieve all of these pieces and because of the because of the nature of the materials and the way that they were put together, it meant that when they came apart, it was this really harsh, really dangerous situation. Um, this wood with these screws sticking out of it in these like crashing waves with me in the water collecting them. So there was a lot about it that was quite violent. And for me, that connected to, you know, what it, this, our relationship in the Caribbean to a certain kind of precision and order, and I think we have a very strong relationship to that in that space. Um, and you know, I think it comes from the ways in which it's being very through our history of colonization, et cetera. So, so yeah, there was a lot of that there. Hmm. <laughs> so interesting. When I was looking at the one in the right corner, it looked like more of a mirror image than one single frame. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what the intention of that was. That's a great question. Um, and yeah, it is. It's three mirror images. And this is kind of a simplistic way of, of talking about it, but it really was me thinking about, as I said, um, what it means, the relationship between the present and the past and the future and the ways in which those things do mirror each other. And here in this form, those things are at this like right angle to each other so they can't come any closer, right, from where you are to the future, to the past. And so as I said, that was related to this idea of, you know, living someplace and thinking about a different past and a different future that you imagine. Yeah. Actually, I have a question. Um, so this is for Christian. Um, in your tribute to Terry, you talk about um, the word making it as st structured as a sculpture, and then taking sculpture and making it as translucent as, as the spoken word. And I'd like to know or hear you talk a bit about how um, your spoken poetry sort of relates to this this larger notion um, and how this began for you. Hmm. How it relates, I didn't catch the last part, to um, the... How it relates to this idea of um, poetry being used as sculpture or right. being used as art. Well, the interesting thing, um, and thank you for that question, Adrian, is that that wasn't my, that wasn't my language. So that was actually a quote from Terry. So one of the things that, um, you know, just to sort of talk about process is that one of the things that I was thinking about in response to the exhibit and what I see as some of the governing artistic strategies was I was thinking a lot about um, two things. I was thinking about um, what, Terry calls potential disclosures or using found texts, right? How do you sort of, or found objects, how do you animate found objects? And the other is juxtaposition. That I think, you know, Sheila, I think everyone is sort of using juxtaposition as a, not only as, a, as, a, as an aesthetic strategy, but almost as an, as an ethic, right? So in terms of this thing of, of the found object, 
for that piece in, in tribute to Terry and what he does um, in his piece Flumens Orationis is I was using language pulled from everywhere, influenced particularly by that piece. So you hear quotes from Terry, you hear quotes from Martin Luther King, whose um, anti-war speech we hear in Terry's piece. We, you hear quotes from Jimmy's machine, Jimi Hendrix's Machine Gun, which is also played in that piece, and then quotes from Terry, from an interview, from emails he sent to me, and so the piece that you quote is really his, his piece, and that's sort of an example of how deeply, um, how deeply irreverent he was when it came to discipline, that he was always thinking across the borders of genre. Um, and it's really inspiring for me, and in terms of um, collaborating with Kara, that I'm envious of her, um, and her, uh, the way she handles materials, I mean, for a poet, it's all in here, but she gets these, you know, objects in space, the physicality of it. So in a lot of ways, inspired by both Terry and, and by my partner, that I was trying to think about, um, you know, what, what, what could language do if I thought of it like a sculpture, like that piece? Um, so the piece that I wrote in response to it was intentionally in, um, in tercets to sort of mirror the structure of the sculpture itself. So it's really, I mean, for me, how I read that Terry quote is really about, in a way, an aspiration and also a failure. You know, what are the limits of language? Um, what, what can I do um, if I'm always reaching out and thinking about other kinds of disciplines to inspire poetry. Hi, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your work. Um, I guess I was quite drawn to what you were talking about in terms of occupying liminal space and the archive. Mm -hmm. And um, I was also quite drawn towards your your use of the free fall and um, these very violent deaths. And so I was just wondering if you could kind of speak about is, was, were you using that as a way to illustrate the liminal space and the memorialization or the archive of these individuals? Or am I reading too much <laughs> into that? <laughs> you should take it. It was your, well, it was Kara's idea, first of all. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was an interplay. Um, huh, that's a, that's a great question, and I feel like that's more so a question for you, but definitely, I mean, and it was this very organic thing, the way that we chose to engage with the fall. Um, and, you know, as I said, like, Anna Mendieta has been just in my head for the last while in yeah. terms of the work that I'm engaged with. Um, and, and yeah, coming across the story of Bella, uh, and it so happened that she died in a building attached to, to where Christian lived when I met him. Yeah. And so there was this, this connection in, in many different ways in terms of, huh. I, and I didn't know about it at all. Right. I mean, I don't know about liminality, but maybe, um, Maybe th th this idea of, of archiving, um, I go back to that quote um, from Derek Walcott's poem, The Sea is History, where he begins um, in the first sentence, where are your monuments, your battles, your martyrs? And he, the speaker says, it's in the sea, right? Um, so there's this thing about what does it mean, again, to be um, a subject without archives? And how is art making this kind of um, invention and reinvention of, of the archive? And so I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe you could talk more about, what, about liminality, <laughs> but, but I think it was more, we were thinking about this thing of what does it mean to be disappeared or disremembered or to be killed, to be killable, and to be killed again. I mean, I think there's a way in which, at least in Bella's story, that her, 
her, that she was killed more than once in, in the way that she's disre disremembered, and also these, the sort of assumptions about her deserving her death, right? This thing, the stereotype of, you know, her, her sister was just on the radio this morning. I don't know if anyone heard talking about how, you know, people have come up to her and say, oh, my cousin is going in that direction and having a high-risk lifestyle and drugs and all these things when, the, I mean, that's simply not true, right? Um, so, the, so there's a kind of thing about how do we archive through art making as a, as a way of um, battling against this kind of disremembering or distorting of those we lost especially. I mean, so there's this kind of political work in memorializing or in, in the elegiac. Hello, thanks. Uh, brilliant. Um, I wanted to come back to the, the Carl Andre moment and, and following up on that, what you were just saying. Um, and maybe if you could both comment a bit more around, it's, I mean, it's not just that, you know, after what happened between Carl and Anna, that, th you know, there wasn't like, a, there was a moment of outcry and then it was sort of, yeah. and then it, but Andre's work still, uh, holds a prominent place. Yeah. It's almost like a reminder, right, yeah. of, uh, of, well, it's just a constant presence. Mm -hmm. It's still there. And her work, not so much, right? right. Like there's this, when, so when you talk about this, this double death, yeah. right, um, it's there too. It's like the ability of the art institution to, to kind of, to just put certain things aside, yeah. right? That we can, we should still like embrace and value Andre Right. as a valuable, important modernist artist, and we can put all that aside. And, and so the, I guess it's not really a question, but it's like the persistence, and maybe you could comment a bit about that persistence of that work, and what does that do to, to mm. um, the modern museum mm. when those kind of presence can, lingers, right? And that it both occupies space and closes the space off. Right. To a, to a multiplicity of perspectives, but it also reinforces that, you know, minimal art, as you were saying, doesn't have anything to do right. with the world around right. it. Right? Hmm. That's not really a question. It's more no, it's <laughs> keep talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, no, it, kind of thing. It makes, it makes me think about a lot of things. As you were speaking, I was thinking about the way in which Andre's work is meant to endure and meant to live forever in a certain way, like to take up its space and hold it forever, as opposed to Anna Mendieta's work, which was this temporal, you know, it couldn't be captured and held in the same way, you know? And mm. it's kind of interesting what that means, like the fact that it was her inclination to engage with the world in that way and his to engage in this very other way. And, you know, I've, I've read a lot of articles. This idea of Anna, her work foretelling the violence of her death, right? Um, and there is, there's something like troubling and eerie there in terms of, you know, all of what that means. Yeah. Um, did you want to? No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, that is a lot to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Hi, uh, I have two questions. Is it on? Yeah. I have two questions. The first is for Kara. I'm wondering, um, how you made the decision to place the materials mm. in landscape of the Caribbean mm -hmm. as opposed to putting it in a natural landscape, say in Canada, mm -hmm. and how the natural landscape of the Caribbean is encoded differently maybe than other landscapes in terms of the history and how that impacted your thought process in making the works. And then secondly for Christian, um, I was thinking of this uh, quote from Zizek in his book Violence where he rewrites this um, phrase by Adorno who wrote that after Auschwitz no poetry is possible and he says <laughs> actually after Auschwitz only poetry is possible mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the trauma of the camps can't be expressed in linear rational language right. and I'm wondering, you spoke about marginality and uh, Aboriginal women who are missing and 
um, the idea of trauma and traumatic death. I'm wondering what you think of the relationship is between uh, poetry and trauma and marginality as a means of, um, I guess, expressing what maybe can't be expressed in language alone, like rational language. Mm. Mm. Wonderful questions. Um, well, I guess I'll say quickly in response to your first question. Um, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it was really meaningful for me that these objects were placed in the Caribbean landscape. Um, so in part, it was a very personal exploration. Like, this work was the first, so I was born in Barbados, but I've spent most of my life here. And this was the first work that I created in the Caribbean um, in this explicit and intentional way. Um, and in terms of the Caribbean landscape, um, I've taken photographs there for years and years and years. And something that I've always been interested in is this interplay between the built and the natural world, specifically in those kinds of tropical places, um, because of how intense that relationship plays out. You see buildings and architecture that literally like crumbles apart yeah. because of the fact that it's constantly up against the elements. Yeah. And I think there was something there for me. And part of, you know, and I don't think I was thinking about this very intentionally, but part of this was about, you know, as I said, recontextualizing these objects, these objects that, you know, were meant in the hands of these men were meant to be absolute, to take up all of the space in the world, to you know, not be affected by anything outside of themselves. And in the Caribbean landscape, there's no space for that. You can build, you can whatever, and it will be taken down. You know, like you're not, we're nothing when we come up against the intensity, the strength of the world around us in that context. So that's part of it, what I was thinking about. Yeah. Wonderful question. I mean, I hear that Adorno quote often, and um, I mean, people talk about how it's misquoted to, you know, that, um, I, I mean, I think what it raises for me is a really important question about art making and, and ethics, right? Um, and I think in, in, in making the poems and some things that I read are not you know, lyric essays and, you know, different kinds of things. But I, I mean, I like what, what you're proposing. I'm with you absolutely about um, the value of the unsaying of poetry. In other words, um, I, what I hear you saying and, and I agree with is, is valuing poetry's confrontation of its own limits in a way. I mean, that's what it is, right? Um, the space between language, the line break, um, the resistance of narrative, right? Linear narrative, as you say, that, that I think there's absolutely a, a value in that. I mean, especially in thinking about the trauma of diaspora um, that is unspeakable, um, but at the same time, um, has a music. So there's a way in which in terms of making poetry, it's, it's sort of about listening for a certain kind of music. It's about um, the placement, again, you know, it's sort of thinking about art making, visual art and sculpture, the placement of language in and of itself. And the space where, where language does not exist, right? Um, the other thing that it doesn't directly answer your question, but in terms of ethics, that I think that in, in making this work that I was really working through my anxieties and, and also pleasures ab about looking, right? The ekphrastic art, this thing of, you know, how do you describe or how do you sort of um, represent in language the visual, which is also in a way an impossible project, right? And that's also the pleasure of it. So I think we're back to the value of poetry being in, in the paradox, right, of what it cannot do, right? But I, I think my anxiety um, is also about the way in which making art is not a pristine art, right? That, 
the, 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 the necessity or the political urgency of, say, displaying that scene from Sami Yatim's murder, or also displaying Grace Jones's body and trying to talk about it, that I was trying to sort of work out my anxieties ab about participating in a certain kind of ob objectification, but also needing to show or needing to say at the same time. So, I mean, I, I, I think that's another way in which poetry was valuable for me to do this work because of, um, because of its deep limitations or the deep limitations of language in and of itself. Comment. This was just wonderful, Krishna and Kara. It's just a comment in terms of how I was responding to that um, structure there. But just thinking of what you were saying there, Krishna, and how you ended it made me think of Audre Lorde's. So it's interesting to hear you think yeah. of poetry as limitation, because we also think of poetry the way you know the way we think with Audre Lorde is the revelatory distillation of experience. Yeah. So, where Toni Morrison says the difference isn't between fact and fiction, but fact and truth. But if we think about that thing about revelatory and its relationship to faith, it's interesting because when I looked at, at that um, installation on, on the beach, and I want to ask you if it's in the East Coast, because Kai was saying it, we thought it might have been Bathsheba, um, some of the earlier ones, the, oh. the, the cube in particular. Yeah, so, it was on the East Coast, not Bathsheba. Okay, right. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was the East Coast. Um, but when I looked at this, when it first flashed up, you know, so it's interesting that you talked about these overlapping temporalities, or we could mm. think of them as palimpsestic, but I saw the church, the coffin, and yeah. the ship. Right. I mean, yeah. was, those, were the th those were actually the three things that, and mm. I don't know what it was about the shape on the ground, but yep. it was the church, the coffin, and the ship were the three things that, that actually sort of emerged immediately Right. Um, when that when that slide popped up, so yeah, yeah. It, that and it's funny. It's those things are something that have been consistently read in this object, and um, and that for me was really. It's not something that I was thinking about in terms yeah. of the construction of it, but it was important for me in thinking through this thing of because this is you know it's this very. Like it's this radical distillation of form that allows for all of these different points of entry and the fact of those readings which are very appropriate to this coming out of our context of the Caribbean. Um, the fact that you, you bring that in how you read this work and yeah. for me that's a kind of challenge to this idea of minimalism not having that kind of relationship to the world around. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I love that Elisa because I mean I, I think in, in my reading of it through the, the poem that I, I was obsessed with bones, right? And thinking about the skeletal. And I think the three um, kind of icons that you threw out there are these sort of ossuaries to think of Dion Brand that sort of hold bones, particularly for you know, people of, 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 the, of diaspora, the, the ship, the coffin, and church are these bones sort of holding sites. So I, I love that. Uh, hey, Christine. Um, I'm going to ask you about this because I, I figure at the same moment you and Cara were working on this project, also you were very involved in the Jean-Michel Basquiat exhibition at the AGO, and then you wrote very beautifully in that catalog Thank you. Uh, a poem. And I'm just wondering if, like, I'm feeling that there's some synergy in some ways between the two shows, the Power Plant show and the AGO show, in terms of themes that maybe um, are under the surface, uh, but, you know, the sense of loss and maybe an unfinished conversation, the sense of, uh, you know, finding beauty where there's been violence and so forth. And I wondered if you yeah. could speak a little bit about your process in this, and if there's been any influence or a feeling of synergy between the two exhibitions in your mind? Absolutely. Um, no, I mean, not in explicit ways. I mean, JMB didn't come up in any of the poems or pieces that I, I shared, but I mean, I think 
in terms of both shows, I go back to that, you know, that Yeats quote, a terrible beauty is born, right? This kind of um, meditation on, on terrible beauty, um, but also, you know, sort of diaspora as a kind of terrible beauty, that how do we, um, how do we dramatize through art this paradox that we live, right? That is not just this concept or this theory that we sort of live, we live this, right? We, in our bones. Um, and I, I mean, in terms of Basquiat, um, there's a kind, what I, what I love about Basquiat too, there's a piece that didn't end up in the show that should have, and I wish called Riding with Death, with a, an image riding a skeleton. And I, you know, stick with the skeleton and back thinking about um, Cara's piece. Um, but I think that Basquiat is inspiring because of his duende, to think about Lorca, in terms of that kind of um, fearless spirit or that fearless confrontation or celebration of mortality, right? Um, and this sort of question that he offers some insight into of what do we do with the violence that we live with, the violence of history, right? Um, how do we transform it, right? How do we make beauty out of it? Which is a question that sort of came up in my response to this exhibit and, and the work here. So absolutely, I mean, I think um, Basquiat is completely inspiring, and he's also a trickster. You know, he's always sort of playing mass with us, and he's also kind of, um, you know, I th think I always think about the way in which Basquiat quarrels with our eyes. So I was thinking a lot in terms of writing poetry about art, about this thing of of the war of watching, or the problem of looking, and the pleasures of looking. And I think we have to consider both at the same time when we look at Basquiat. Thanks, thanks very much. Okay. <laughs> I, before, um, before we end, I just, we just want to say thank you to so many people, I mean, thank you to all of you for coming out in this cold and rainy, and I know you could have been home in your bed. So we really appreciate it. We're very <laughs> humble that you came out. And, you know, we give thanks to Gaetan Bernard. We really admire what you're doing. We really appreciate um, the support and this opportunity to Christine Bowen, who is in here because she's resting her leg. Um, Adrian Constantino, we really appreciate the support. Um, Eleni McKinnon, Beth Wong, um, Div Padir, Todd Nichols, Kim Trollope, Andrea Strawn, and any Harborfront and Power Plant staff that have contributed, we really give thanks and we appreciate it. <laughs>